We're really excited to um, have Fernando Chang joining us today. Some of you uh, in the OPO community that we work with have already um, either knew him before he started working with CompuMed um, or have worked with him now that he's been consulting with us. He brings a wealth of knowledge. He's the lead pathologist assistant at uh, the University of Ho Hospital in Rutgers Medical School. He's an expert in lab setup in the operational aspects and donor organ frozen technique. And today he's gonna to share some of that with you and um, hopefully provide some insight on what is available and, and then eventually how CompuMed can help you with that. So with that, Fernando, welcome and it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Um, and I just wanna thank you, the entire team of CompuMed for um, uh, allowing me to present uh, this important topic. Uh, I just want to make a, 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 a point that uh, I work for University Hospital in Newark and Rutgers Medical School is um, uh, their program, residency program. Uh, we host the residency program. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, I would like to, if I can, um, dedicate this presentation to uh, Dr. Steven Peters, back in 2009, I was um, in front of him on a job interview. And it was already 30 minutes of this interview. And uh, actually it was uh, playing the guitar. He always had uh, his guitar with him. And I were playing chords. We were talking the first 15 minutes about uh, fishing lures and stuff like that. And I, you know, was, uh, I just said all due respect to Peters, uh, would you like to know about my expertise. Um, back in my old country, I'm a physician surgeon. And I was thinking when this uh, interview about the technical aspects of the job are gonna come. And, and Dr. Peters uh, said to me, um, I know your work, I already checked what's your work, but I really need to know if I can work with you. I need a person that I can work with. And I just wanna dedicate this presentation to Dr. Steven Peters. Uh, husband, father, uh, professor, mentor, and a dear friend that uh, unfortunately, um, you know, departed just recently from us. And it's relevant to talk about Dr. Stephen Peters today as well, because he, is, uh, he was an inventor. He invented uh, many ways of doing frozen section and he studied frozen sections. He publicized a book about frozen sections as well and is the founder of Pathology Innovations. Um, and that's what is extremely relevant to think about Dr. Peters, not only from this emotional part of, of, of myself as um, uh, uh, he was my mentor and learning about many things through almost 15 years with, uh, with him until he retired, but also because it comes uh, a huge question for OPOs. And if this uh, technique about frozen sections and the setup of a lab uh, is really doable, possible, is feasible on a the OPO setting, and the question, the answer for this question is uh, absolutely. That's this is it's perfectly doable, and by assembling this um, group of essential tools and certain methodologies that uh, we learned through many years of experience, the OPOs can um, achieve this and can perform this process of preparing high. Uh, quality frozen sections and that are extremely crucial when um, uh, the selection of organ that uh, organ transplantation comes and uh, secure um, a diagnosis for um, the potential people, the, the recipients in this case. So we have, uh, we set some um, really humble objectives um, in this webinar, but extremely important as well. Um, the first one is in this setting of the OPO, uh, what kind of lab equipment is the basic lab equipment that an OPO needs in order to perform this procedure? Uh, we're gonna talk about the physical aspects a little bit, and we're gonna talk about the tools as well. And I hope um, that's, this is going to uh, enlighten everybody in the OPO uh, community to um, Make more, uh, uh, be curious about how we can set up this uh, lab uh, for um, frozen sections. Then we're going to go into the next topic, 
which is going to be the uh, organ and the donor organ frozen section techniques. And this this is really um, a big, huge topic. It's, 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 it's hundreds of publications about frozen section techniques. It's uh, Dr. Peter devoted um, most of his life and teaching frozen section techniques through dozens of residents in these 14 years uh, we work together. And um, it's, it's really a lot of technique and many things, but at the same time, this process is extremely simple. And we're gonna go, we're gonna see why and how. And then we're gonna end um, this uh, objective. Um, the objectives of this webinar, I'll talk about a little bit about troubleshooting and problem solving. Why is this important? Because when we actually isolate what is wrong in this frozen section, let's say, let's, let's pick the, the, the frozen section uh, freezing artifact, and we can identify why this, ha why this is happening, there are ways to mitigate that, ways that are going to allow to um, find exactly in which part of this process um, we can improve and we can do better. And what we're not covering this webinar is basically the tail facility requirements, uh, codes, for instance, construction code. This will be not the the need for this, um, then not not the spirit of this webinar. And uh, the regulatory and compliance, I think we can talk about that a little bit, but we're not going to do it in in deep because it's it's a huge um, topic about that as well. So we start the presentation um, talking about uh, the lab equipment, the basic. Um, I'm sorry, the facility setup. This is the, the physical space. And obviously we're dealing with uh, certain chemicals, volatile substances, and then we have, we need good ventilation. In the event we are working with silene, for instance, um, there are certain types of hoods that are silene um, uh, approved and filters that are silene uh, approved. And, and then we can use this type of uh, filters, for instance. There are others that are uh, related to formalin, for example. Um, and as and 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 also if, even if you're using silene substitutes, like many labs nowadays are using it, they are a little more expensive, or a bit expensive than using a silene, and they offer less uh, harmful um, uh, qualities or properties. But still, these fumes need to be controlled. Then we go to basic illumination. Uh, in order to perform this job, we need to have good lighting. Uh, we need to have a place also to wash the equipment and also we need, a, if we use tap water or distilled water for the solutions, we still need a sink there and this is very important to have. Um, then we have basic things like proper disposal of biohazard material. Uh, there are regulations in case for this, uh, OSHA dictates uh, many ways of, of, of disposing the biohazard, potentially contaminated tissue is coming to an OPO lab in the form of fresh tissue. So contaminants uh, are potentially present. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting agents, um, there are multiple of them, but when we are talking about uh, equipment that is working at minus 23 degrees, uh, the presence of water obviously is not needed. And then we're gonna look for certain um, uh, disinfecting cleaning agents that can be virucidal, bactericidal, or uh, tuberculocidal that also meet the requirement to clean this equipment without leaving water behind and you know creating uh, crystals and 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 is is definitely not ideal for this type of equipment. <clears throat> And then at the end, we have the supplies. The supplies will be the consumables. Consumables, and it comes in general in many ways. And examples are blades, for instance. Um, uh, the blades that we uh, we always advocate to use one blade per patient. Uh, the cost of 75 cents approximately to $1. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to have these surges that cost thousands of dollars and not to change a blade for every patient as well. That is a safe procedure for uh, the operator, the cryotomist. And in the um, unfortunate event that this person have a, um, an accident with a blade, we know perfectly how we can trace the patient. And that's why it's important to change blades and something that Dr. Peters always advocate uh, about that and um, I think I mean, it is to mention it. Um, <clears throat> and so now we're gonna go into what is the basic lab equipment. So the center of this, uh, uh, lab equipment is definitely the cryostat. The cryostat is a machine that allows us to cut at lower temperatures, uh, sections, fine sections, in this case, sections that go in microns, a uh, thousand power of a millimeter. And there are many options in the market. Um, 
like uh, uh, cryostats are well known are um, in many, many places, many hospitals, like the CM1850, the 1860 that comes with different um, advantages too, the 1950, um, they're, you know, pretty, 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 um, pretty used in, in, in many places around. Then um, most, you know, uh, newer equipment are the Avantic QS, uh, QS12, and um, the one in the picture is the Epridia. And many of these equipment have different advantages and many features that make uh, possible for your lab um, be you know more attractive. Also, our variations in price. Some of them have UV light, which is ex excellent um, as a uh, as a um, disinfecting agent um, using ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. Uh, then another ones are like self cleaning vacuum systems as well. Um, remember this again. We're going back to the concept that we are uh, working with potentially um, infected samples, and cleaning these samples, we need to be very careful not to aerosolize these uh, thin, very thin uh, sections that that contain tissue as well. Um, there are all of other things, for instance, like the uh, epridia that we see in the picture. Uh, some of them are like adjustable, so you can adjust uh, the, the you know how high is the equipment, so you don't need to bend much, and and it goes for the operator, the cryotomist, um, you know depending on the size of the person. Um, let's see, there, we're gonna talk about Dr. Peter's uh, cryo embedding system and and proximal. Then we, can, we see to the right the the uh, stainer. It's a linear stainer. It's an automatic stainer. As you can see, there are. Uh, multiple receptacles, uh, stations, I will say, where we have the uh, chemicals. Uh, from left to right, in this case, it's uh, starting on the left and, and the staging area is to the right. Uh, it's uh, very good because this is standardized the time. We have time for every station. Uh, for instance, in some places, in my place, uh, we use one minute for hematoxylin um, and 30 seconds for eosin, for instance, and Every uh, we can set up the time for every station depending on the preference, but we're going to talk about that. How we can how actually the intention of make this unit from this whole process of cutting frozen it will help the community as well. Then we have a basic cutting board and then some um, lab equipment that we're going to have around uh, and and the basic lab setup. Okay, so we're going to have some uh, poll questions. We're just going to continue. All right. So this is a, an, an a slide that is going to help us more or less to understand or to kind of go from this big context, how is this technical process happening and the biopsy process itself. Obtaining the biopsy, we're not going to entertain too much because this is uh, for the surgical center to you know, happening, but we're going to uh, definitely um, focus on the creating this slide and then how we can, how actually once we have the slide, how we um, have the slide and digitize this slide, how to uh, uh, create a digital image of this slide. And this whole technical process is going to uh, present our pathologies. In this case, it will be the professional service of this um, entire biopsy process. And we will read it for reading. For reading, uh, creating this slide. Creating this slide, we have um, I divided this in embedding, sectioning, and staining. And every single of these steps, uh, it will give us a challenge um, of how to do it and the technique we can use. It will make the difference between the result, uh, the slide, and and then the quality of this slide. It's gonna depend of like we're gonna see the. Uh, Later on, um, oh, second, let's see the next one. And we're going to talk about a little bit of a the flat embedded system. In this case, if we go back, it will be the embedding part. And I'm just going to go in this picture. And I'm going gonna, gonna to show you how. Um, this checks to the right where it says alternative system. This is the old way we, how we used to embed tissue. 
using these chalks. And you can see how the tissue is in different levels and different angles. Even the one in the right is kind of popping out. And if we cut the section, chances are that this uh, tissue might pop out from the chalk. Obviously, this is not ideal. If we have a, a core biopsy, it will go to waste. So that's why Dr. Peters uh, invented this system. And you can see that chucked into the left. And this is perfectly flat. Now you can see a spaces into the, into the, uh, surrounding the tissue. But we use a technique called plastering that also um, is part of the training. And that will hold the tissue in a perfectly flat plane. And when the tissue meets the blade, um, it will it will meet the tissue evenly. It will meet the blade evenly, and we will uh, control how much um, sample are we gonna trim or efface in this case. So going back to the cryo embedding system, and we get to this point because of that, because that embedding of the samples uh, never guarantee a sample, especially a small biopsy, to be on the surface. Sometimes it was too deep into the OCT and the media that we use to hold the tissue. And sometimes it was too superficial or maybe in an angle. And that prevented to have a one entire length of this, the tissue once the tissue was actually stained. And that at the end, we were having parts and fragments of tissue. And that's the reason why perfectly flat is extremely important. Um, this actually uh, help us also to facilitate how deep into the uh, block we're gonna go. Uh, the technique of effacing or presenting the tissue at the level of obtaining sections um, is something that it needs to go to a level that we are not too deep, but we're not too superficial as well. If we are too superficial, maybe we're gonna have sections of the tissue, intermittent sections, and if we are too deep into the tissue, maybe we're going to have additional levels and we're going to exhaust the entire tissue, wasting sample. Mm, there is a sample preparation that uh, that might be at grossing, and I use the quotation mark because really at this point, when I have the uh, slide with the cutting table, uh, in the case of kidney biopsies, kidney biopsies, especially wedges, sometimes come with a little piece of perirenal fat. And uh, fatty tissue are uh, also is not conducted. It doesn't conduct, it doesn't transfer, or it doesn't, um, it's, a, it's not conducting at all, the, the conductive of temperature. So then uh, at minus 23, we won't be able to cut fatty tissue if we put, if we place the fat in front of the blade. It will actually will um, continue to give us problems. And, and that's why, especially for kidney biopsies, for wedge biopsies, we need to trim a little bit of the tissue and then uh, proceed to embed. Um, then we have the liver wedge biopsies that uh, also, um, the because of the water content of, of the kidney, perhaps offers a little more challenging. And in the case of a liver wedge, the, the, the challenge is not the same. Now, the cryo-embedded system of Dr. Peters has so many parts. Um, to be honest, that it was not probably the spirit of this presentation. Um, dispensing slides, brushes, and many other things. Um, but the basic idea to understand how the tissue goes flat is just looking at the well bar. You see these compartments, this in this case is the 24 millimeter. They have the 18, the 24, and the 30 millimeter, depending on the size. I believe for our um, purposes, we can use perfectly the, the 24 millimeter uh, well bar. And when you dispense the tissue on the in, in each receptacle, you can see that the tissue is gonna go flat. And uh, the time you put the OCT, um, it's gonna freeze in a perfectly uh, contained area. Then the chuck with this uh, uh, cuboidal pattern they have, affixes and secures the OCT. So even though you apply a little force, it's not gonna chunk out of that. And finally, because the difference of temperature, um, we need to uh, kind of extract heat from the tissue that is at room temperature in the OCT as well. And we have this freezing block um, that is going to be like a heat extractor, basically. And it's gonna extract the heat from the sample. 
uh, accelerated the process of freezing tissue. Then we go back, we already, um, we already look at this. Um, now I have a sample, a little bit of sectioning. And I'm gonna stop the video, hold on one second. Let me stop the video right there. And you keep the shattering on top. That's a fair for example of shatter. Why? Because that part of the tissue was very cold. And when the blade meets something at a, a different, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different hardness of the block, then the blade and that level start jumping on top of the, uh, the OCT and they give you that shatter pattern. Then I proceed to warm up the block and you see how the section is coming out. Uh, those little holes were before, but you can see how even the section is coming. At the end, it's gonna be a little thin part. I don't know if you can see that too as well, but. Yeah, and then you can see how even uh, the section is coming with a shutter. And this is everything about controlling the temperature of the chuck. And there are so many other things as well. Is the like we can we need to listen also the chuck uh, crunchy biopsies, you're gonna you're gonna hear the, the block and the blade meeting the block and it's gonna be a sound, a special characteristic sound that is gonna tell you immediately this is too cold. Don't continue. Don't even don't even continue. Not even a face in the block. You need to warm up that block. Uh, staining. So staining. Um, hematoxylin eosin is being used since forever, since the eighteen hundreds. Um, it's um, hematoxylin is a, is an organic occurring dye um, discovered back in the fifteen hundreds. Imagine that um, eosin was added to that. And this is the gold standard for staining. Mm. For instance, if we use um, different compound, in this case, silene or subtitles of silene, uh, remember we had to use a hood um, no matter what. It's always uh, important to, to control the fumes. Uh, and in this case, we have the Leica ST420. Um, that's a linear staining, automatic staining. And we can see this uh, at work in this short video that I took. And you can see how it goes from one station to the other one. And depending on the time, in this case, it will be three hematoxylins because the time. And then you go probably a bluing agent and dip the tissue. Uh, I'm just gonna replay this so we can see how it goes. It's, so the slides are supposed to be in that black uh, holder. So the slides are being dipped there. And then it goes to the next one. And that's how it works. And this is really a, a good a good tool because then the time of of every sample is is a uniform is a is a time that is um, standardized. So if we standardize the process of doing frozen sections, we will be able to identify exactly where in the process is um, is perhaps something. And regarding a staining, um, I think I have a question um, before about hematoxin, it should be filtered or not. Also, if the solutions are not being used or, or used uh, uh, not that frequent. Um, and I have a comment to do, uh, besides the, the comment, the normal comment that I say, it depends how much you use it. If you don't use it, then you don't change it. Um, but I wanna add something that I found out later with the years. To begin with hematoxylene, it will interact with the uh, oxygen in the atmosphere. So it will process, it will suffer an oxidation process. And if you see that, if you don't use the hematoxin for you know longer than perhaps eight to 12 hours, you're gonna see a film on top of hematoxin. And that at the time you place the slides are gonna create you um, artifact as well, a staining artifact. The other thing is that is the carryover. The carryover is also something that we need to uh, keep in mind because every time we introduce the sample, the first one, right, in the water, or perhaps uh, when um, the, to the first station, and then it goes to the next one, but it's gonna be the debris of the sample itself, remaining in hematoxylin. And then at the time we go um, 
deep in the tissue in, it will, um, all of this precipitate, it will go into the slide. So that's, that's one thing to, to consider. Second is like, you have 95% alcohol, 100%. Perhaps 100% will remain 100%, um, but the solution is gonna definitely evaporate. So you need to add, you need to interact with the station, even if you don't use it at all. And the other thing is the 95%, the alcohol will evaporate and you will have 95% at the end of the week. So you see, it is, and if we try to look for something to do a standard, and we try to say, okay, you know what, the problem is not the staining, because the chart said that the technician changed this uh, stains on Monday, religiously every Monday. So if, if we see something uh, as a result, we can eliminate this because we said we all do the same thing. We all do the same the, the same amount of, of time, right? Like one minute, 1 1.5 minutes. And hematoxylin, we all, always use this, the 30, 30, 30 seconds and eosin. And this is a standard procedure. No other lab is doing different time. And, and, and that's what we're trying to work with um, and make this whole process standardized so we can eliminate um, problems. It comes uh, our next uh, poll question. Okay, and just to iterate that um, uh, the cutting, and that's the only time we're really gonna use the cutting and the, uh, uh, for kidney transplant or liver transplant, there is for kidney. And when I say streaming fat, that might be the sample that is gonna prevent to have good sections as well. So it's not a small detail, it happens. So the next part will be the embedding. And we see the embedding um, uh, using the 24 millimeter bar. Uh, and for embedding, we remember it has to be perfectly flat. Uh, the sample need to be in the center. It need to be surrounded by OCT uh, because if it's too close to the edge, we're gonna have problems picking up that sample. And the way I try to uh, work with this is a technique that I um, that I change the angle of the actually the block, and I present the block. Uh, on one of the corners of the block, one of the angles of the block, so it meets the blade. And increasingly, instead of meeting the blade in the flat part, which is gonna present a higher surface of resistance meeting the blade, I do it in a uh, V-shape of fashion. So the resistance will be gradually increasing. So it will be less um, vibration of the blade and less resistance and more natural cutting. Just. Uh, to mention something about uh, embedding and then sectioning um, offers that. And as well, we got to add temperature. Um, if it's too cold, the block or it's too, too, too warm and not cold enough yet, uh, we need to, it, it now offers uh, the different problems, for instance, that might not look like this is staining um, because it's too dark. And we say, why is too dark? If we're using an automatic stainer and the sample is going through the same time. And the answer is because the sample, the, the section is too thick. The thickness of the section, you can set up this uh, five microns, for instance, but it necessarily doesn't mean that it's a five microns if the block is too hot. If the block is too hot, it's just like butter, it will cut thicker sections and the staining is gonna be richer because of these layers of cells, one on top of the other, and then the over stain or maybe too pignotic for uh, the reading, it's not because the stainer part or you didn't change the solutions or any other reason or you left this the the, the solution for so, so long because again, it's an automatic stainer is because the sample is actually too thick. Same thing goes to the other end when it's too thin. When it's too thin, um, a, the, for instance, you wanna cut a four or three, a three microns, the even at three microns, you might have a vocalization of the nuclei and then you will have little holes in the nuclei because at three microns, that's, that's what happens. Besides the fact that it's gonna be very difficult for the person cutting at three microns, believe me, it's really cut difficult. I cut kidneys at three microns and it's, it's really challenging. Okay, and then we're gonna go to an extremely important topic because many of these um, uh, kidneys in general, livers as well, that uh, they are decided to be discarded. They are de decided to be discarded based on the frozen section reading. So the pre-implant um, you know, process 
uh, this uh, organ uh, is being decided, the fate of this organ is being decided with the frozen section reading. And the frozen section reading will have this, this different type of artifacts. Artifacts are artificial products or byproducts of something that we can see in the microscope, the pathology have in front of them, but they are not real at all. And this is just technique. And I want to, um, you know, uh, kind of repeat um, as many times as I can, like just Dr. Peters used to tell the residents and myself, um, everything is just the way you do it. Your intention doesn't count. You might have a good intention, but if you don't follow this technique and you follow these steps and you control the temperature, you, there are certain things you cannot control. Like for instance, this um, picture that we see um, is kidney. Kidney has definitely more water. Um, and because of that, it will be exposed a little more to this uh, freezing artifact. And you can see the kidney into the right, and you can see the tubules. This is not a diagnostic purpose presentation, but we can see how shrink is the tubule into the right. It's really shrinking this high halo of, 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 of emptiness on the side, obviously, was, uh, it was because of the presence of water and the crystallization of water. And believe me, this kidney is exactly the same kidney into the left. But we don't see that anymore. And, it's, it, and, and this is technique. This is pure technique. Our residents um, that are coming every year, um, sometimes some of them, they live in seeing a Christ and in their entire lives, they're rotating in, in many other parts of the hospital, but pathology sometimes is not the first one or the, the, the one that I go first. Um, but so they never seen a Christ that, <laughs> and believe me, at the first and second day, they are doing beautiful frozen sections. Again, this is muscle memory. It's uh, about listening to the to the to the block being cut. It's about looking the section itself is even or has uh, thick and thin areas. It's about the temperature of the block. So it is it's it's a lot of muscle memory. So it's 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 a process that again, like I said, our residents are on duty really soon after they start, and after hours they are the ones that are cutting the frozen by themselves. So they learn this really quick and with great results. Um, continue with these artifacts. We have shattering. We talk about that is the temperature and water content and the flexibility of the block. Uh, then we have a certain compression artifacts like a darker chromatin nuclear ice crystals. And we see these nuclear ice crystals more when the, the section is, is thinner. A drying artifact. Once we obtain the section, Immediately, that section is uh, five microns. And this section, obviously, it's exposed to the draft of the room and to desiccation. And that desiccation, it's uh, really bad because the passage of these dyes, you know, in contact with the, the, the tissue, they're going to be, um, they're not going to interact well with the tissue. So if you see a haze, a slide, that you know, it's not well stained, and it's like it's cloudy. It's it's not just crispy. And you ask yourself, you know, what kind of artifact this is? Like it's not it's not there, but it's there. So what happened is that this sample perhaps it was left more than five to eight seconds air drying before it's placed in in a fixative. That's where we propose some of the places that are not even they were carrying the samples into the stainer directly. But we propose, and as per Dr. Peter's directive, um, to have a, a fixative, it would be 95% or some uh, proprietary that are in the market as well, that is a mix of formalin and a very, very, very light uh, uh, concentration of formalin and alcohol. And immediately you, you take the section, the section, you pick up the section in the slide, you did that immediately. And that prevents 100% the drying artifact. And obviously this pale, Haze staining on the on the slide. The Venetian effect. Um, um, I heard that a Venetian effect might be by a dull blade. Well, it's not going to happen to us because again, I said we change blades every and every single patient. Uh, but the Venetian effect, I've seen it more when there are moving parts. So the cryost has multiple moving parts. Obviously, it moves. The machine moves. But uh, we know that the stage also have different angles that we can graduate, we can move the stage actually right to left. So there are multiple levers on the on the cryostat. And and the holder of the chuck as well, uh, it has also an angle that we can change and, and, and modify. 
So how come if we we fix this the day before or maybe a few days before, now I have this Venetian effect again, and the presenter of this webinar told us that it's because something is moving there. Well, remember, Christ have cycles of the frosting and going back to the minus 20, 25 degrees, whatever your lab decided. We propose a set temperature, so we all on the same page. But regardless of that, they have cycles of towing and, and freezing. Well, this, this is exactly the same principle of physics that expansion and contraction. And believe it or not, these parts, these uh, levers are going to get loose from one day to the second day. So every day, the technician should check these um, levers and make sure that all the non-moving parts shouldn't be moving. Okay. And then we have a stain in the brief for like, uh, it was on the questions about filtering hematoxin. And I already mentioned why we had to definitely filter hematoxin as well. Um, because it's staying in the brief. It's the carryover. It's not like you filter once maybe the hematoxin, but you don't change that every day. But it's still the carryover from the frozen section and previous, and especially in heavy places where we have a lot of frozen sections, we have 15, 20 frozen sections at once sometimes, definitely we need to filter uh, hematoxin. Uh, shattering, this is a perfect example of shattering. And, and the funny part of this, uh, or actually the curious part of that, you see that this is the kidney. To the right, you see a lot bunch of two wheels and stuff. And then and you see you don't see the shattering that is to the left. And the reason is because this particular section of tissue has um, a normal kidney and a tumor. And the tumor perhaps it has more water content than edema, right? Local edema. And um, and the cells there have more water content. And 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 then you can see the shattering and this breaking up because the nature of the tissue as well. So um, it's not uncommon, but it can be fixed. Uh, freezing artifact, uh, this is special because you can see a lot of freezing artifact in the image to the right. Um, and then in the image to the left, you don't see it, but it, the, the, the interesting part is that this is actually uh, the, the same patient. Our pathologist, uh, CompuMed, determined that, okay, this is freezing artifact. And this is a good thing, this is a good call because the pathologist, it, this is definitely inoperable and immediately go for a repeat. And you can see, we're not gonna tag this as micro, micro osteoporosis or anything, triads or nothing, but we can see the difference between both and one with freezing artifact, one without freezing artifact. And again, the uh, cryotomist was able to identify what was the problem, probably in this case, the definite temperature warm up a little bit the block and the results are there and um and yeah so so this 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 um this kidney uh, I mean this this organ probably regardless of the fate of the organ we know our pathologists make the decision and and produce a diagnosis with uh certainty and confidence that the slide prepare and the slide presented to this person, uh, this uh, our professional, our pathologist, is uh, is a real is is whatever you know the tissue represents with damage or without damage, with a lot of uh, uh, certainty can say this tissue is good for being um, uh, uh, transplanted or not. So that's why it's extremely important for OPOs to have um, the right frozen section and to follow the right techniques and to have results that are accurate and not to end um, discarding an organ that otherwise will be um, of help. And even if a small percentage of these organs are um, are taken, to say, from discard for the person who are actually waiting on this line, this is, you know, very important and very pertinent. Um, finally, uh, I want to talk about something that we were talking before and it's uh, continuous training. And this is what we propose for our OPOs to have this a standardized way to do these frozen sections, learn the techniques that are presented um, and that already been proven. For instance, um, this is our Padma, our supervisor Padma from SDA. Um, she is practicing as well. And, and it's proven that the more they practice, the more uh, people actually learn how to do these techniques. And in a very easy, easy way and in, in, in their own setting, they will uh, perform uh, and then they will do uh, excellent frozen sections 
and we can obtain optimal slides for the pathologist to read. Um, now, it also helps us because in the event we don't have um, optimal slides, well, we know in which part of the process we, uh, could be the problem. Is that the cutting of the sample? Maybe we have to trim a little bit fat. Is that the embedding? Because it's too next to the border, maybe it's not you know, perfectly flat embedded. Uh, it's at uh, the time of sectioning, uh, the temperature, the blade, uh, the angle, moving parts, uh, too much water for the fish, for instance. So we were able to identify which part of the process is, uh, and we didn't even go to the to the remediation because we 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 got it right at the beginning. That's uh, that's the beauty of using this system and learning the proper techniques. We don't have to repeat something that uh, we already can do it um, very well. Um, so we can isolate the problem is human, mechanical, software, uh, digital software related. Okay, I have another poll question. I think we're running out of time, sorry. All right. And the use of telepathology, um, digital imaging is a whole different chapter. It's been there for a while. A previous kind of scope with uh, Leica using uh, image analysis. Uh, then we have the one we use at the CompuMed is the Grundium. You can see how portable it is. And you can take this scanner and the software is actually amazing um, to use uh, and, to, and to read this frozen sections remotely. Other brands like Motic, Morfle also are in the um, business of uh, digital imaging. Um, we're not the only ones, radiology also uses that as well. Um, where are different ways, um, but we need the scanners for the slides, that's for sure. Um, and it also pre presents challenges as well, because these machines use software and they have connections with um, uh, networks, right? And they have servers. So uh, that also creates some a small chapter of, of troubleshooting as well. But uh, as long as a person who has uh, the right training, they can identify exactly what is the problem and remediate the issue. Okay, and uh, lately, uh, lastly, the QC. So at Compumet, we um, always um, achieve for um, the best results. And we have uh, developed an organized way to do our quality control about the sample size and volume. That's the first thing. Why we receive one core, two cores, a wedge, or what is the size of the wedge? Is this is 0.3, is 0.5? Um, it still had to be documented because uh, believe it or not, uh, even in retrospective or prospective studies, um, this is extremely relevant. Some people are advocates of uh, core biopsies. Some people are advocates of wedge biopsies. Some of the people advocate for both um, or and a wedge, because they have different advantages and disadvantages regarding the core might go linearly into the parenchyma of the tissue, right? While the wedge might have a chunk, but uh, hemostasis is, is a problem when you have a chunk of tissue out, even if it's a small. So it, it has a different challenges. And, and good thing is that a lot of people is paying attention into this um, sample size. And they are actually, mm, creating studies to find out statistically and in a formal way, what is ideal. And this is what is about medicine. You're always being curious and finding the, the, the best way to do things uh, for uh, the benefit of the patients or our patients. Uh, a slight fixation, I said, you know, um, when we obtain the section immediately, but I said immediately need to be um, deep into this uh, fixation in order to prevent desiccation and avoid this um, uh, drying artifact. This is especially important when we do touch preps. And then um, embedding cryotomy, I think we went through already about that. Um, and we want to know, and when we do this, we so say we see we have shattering effect. I mean, we have shattering, we have um, um, freezing artifact, or we have initial effect. Um, then we identify, you know, if we're doing right or wrong, human, machine. Uh, prevent and maintenance of the equipment. We haven't talked about that, but it's extremely important to have prevent and maintenance of any equipment um, and document that as well. A staining, changing the stains, uh, even if they're not used, you see why we have to change the stains. And 
lately, uh, lastly, the digital pathology scan that we already discussed. And let's see what comes here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I think. Um, uh, so, Fernando, I'm going to jump in on a couple of um, questions that were posted during the the webinar. Thank you. It's just so so helpful. Um, earlier when you were talking about um, the actual freezing part, so there's a um, couple questions that are tied together. One of them is, is, can we dab the water off of the specimen to avoid freezing artifact? And um, she also, Sharon also asked us, uh, do you filter the, excuse me, the hemotoxylin every day? Uh -huh, okay. Um, so, so, so every tissue, like, um, they has different contents of water. Uh, within it with uh, kidney and within it with um, with liver, but how it, it perhaps this might be a small detail, but it's extremely important how the sample actually reach the lab. Is an saline solution? Well, there's a lot of water. Then, then, then that's not ideal. Or is in a telpha pad, and is telpha pad is moist, so to prevent desiccation of the tissue as well, and that's obviously ideal. But um, even those small details make a huge difference. Now, regarding a how to, well, every tissue comes with the water content that is related to uh, previous factors. If this is a kidney, obviously it's gonna have water content because that's what the kidney does, right? <laughs> Excuse me, uh, filtering. Um, and, and then we cannot really control that uh, taking water out of the tissue. Perhaps livers that come with less um, less uh, water content, but um, it depends on the tissue, and there is no way to extract the water out of the tissue. The, the, otherwise, we will be a uh, um, uh, completely, you know, um, altering the architecture of the tissue. But okay. how it is received is important. And filtering a methoxin, definitely yes. I think this one, this one may cover a couple others um, here too. Is um, from like how long how long would it take a coordinator be, to become competent at this in your opinion uh, i would say with uh, first we have a small um, theory introduction is the theory the theoretical facts that got to be important for the person to understand what is it doing you cannot do anything if you don't understand what you're doing and and this is just basic basics basics of the basics about uh, observation um, I would say, and and like we think before with STA, in three days that we work with the technicians, and then we reinforce that um, with um, with them, they they they're able to cut frozen sections, you know, and more consistently basis, and 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 doing better work. So, so I would say it's much quicker than people would think. Oh, absolutely, yes. I, like I mentioned before, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Um, and we can share more of that. Um, there, there's some other questions in here too. They're they're coming in fast and furious at the end. Um, one of them is 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 what do you think would be kind of a, an estimated cost of the slide stainer that you had shown in the presentation? Um, the stainer, I would say maybe um around ten k to fifteen k. I'm not completely sure. Where a Christ that will I know it will be around thirty to forty k. Um, okay. but the linear stainer, I will calculate that will be around fifteen to twenty k. Even oh, the small one. There's another one, the Fisher one. I know the Fisher one is like five k. It's a little more simple than the other one because it's more like a conveyor, and the Fisher is that uh, is around five k. But the other one has a staging has a yeah. Uh, a panel that is kind of um um it has probably a computer chip or something like that that is kind of more sophisticated with a staging area probably that will be around 10k 10 so it's a big range K. based on what you're getting uh-huh same yes. thing okay and then um what do you think of uh, one of the questions here is when doing h and e of samples other than kidney and liver samples are there any staining techniques that are needed different staining techniques I know that's probably a loaded question, and we have limited time. So, um, well, the deep quicks um, that is also used, especially for um, lymphoproliferative disease. Let's say for um, for touch preps, for instance, the deep quick is is, is very common to use. Um, it really stands out the lymphocytes. Um, but uh, the H and E is the standard. I don't 
really work with anything different through the years and through the places other than H and E. And again, the diff quick um will be for um uh, uh patch preps and and for lymphoproliferative diseases. It stains really well the uh the lymphocytes. Okay. Um, and then on here there was a, and I think this ties into a couple other questions in general. The um, I mean, we can all read it about the the stains on a weekly basis that um that they're changed and kind of what is your guideline on that? And I think you addressed that earlier, but if you want to reemphasize that, yes, I will do that because again, I said the carryover first the carryover, second is the evaporation of uh, and then the 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 precipitation, and then the formation of film, especially in hematoxylin. The hematoxylin tend to oxidize, uh, you know, after a few obviously it's not a few, the fewer is immediately you open the container, but you can see the results of this oxidation maybe between 12 to 48, 12 to um, 24 hours, and you'll see a film on top of the uh, hematoxylin. And that's also um, a problem because it's when you dip the uh, slide to a stain, uh, it will be on the slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and here's one that came in um, during the presentation is when a slide does not have a significant number of glomerular lie. Is that an issue with the sample size or cutting technique? Well, that's that's basically set up for what we can obtain. And again, 25 is the gold standard for um, kidneys. Um, and obviously 25 it will be in a really small um, fragment of tissue. So I don't think less than 25 uh, glomeruli will guarantee a, a good reading unless use five five or six um, glomeruli that are so sick and so, you know, um, not happy looking that perhaps with that, you can say, wow, this is, you know, a different, I don't want to enter in diagnosis or anything like that, but um, the gold standard is, is 25 glomeruli. And, and, and I guess a wedge is, is always ideal because you can see, you can see more in that. You can see interstitial, you can see glomeruli, you can see blood vessels, uh, you can see tubules a lot, and then and it will have give you a, a better picture of that. But if you see something that is really critical, um, and two or three glomeruli, or perhaps this is all over the place as well, something okay. severe. I'm talking. And, and I noticed there's a couple on here, and I just want to reiterate about the regulatory and the OSHA um, Compumed and 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 Fernando were not really qualified it to, to address <clears throat> regulatory. So um, I, I just want whoever submitted those, I wanted to let you know that we weren't. Um, but I just want to mention something so really short about that, that we all are still on the umbrella of uh, OSHA, for instance, and, and in, the, in the setting of labs, uh, we still had to follow biohazard, right? PPE, yeah. use of PPE, and many other things that are common to any surgery center. And that's under the OSHA umbrella. And okay. that's something... That's that's, that's helpful. Just mm -hmm. yes, that part of it. So um what one other question is is um so are you, Fernando, available to um to train at the DCU units and to help? That's a oh, yeah, absolutely. That will be that will be um something really good. I'm looking forward to uh work with them. Every time I um, go for a training, uh, I learn new things. And this is the beauty of, 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 of teaching and at the same time it's learning as well. This is a constant process and I will be honored and thrilled to do that. I'm gonna sneak one more in um, that just came in. Uh, while preparing multiple slides at once, what's the best practice to store the slide informally while waiting to stain? Oh, okay, so you have multiple frozens, let's say, and you have them um, and you're cutting out, you know, when you have multiple frozens, usually we have it in a rack and then we have them in, in the fixative until we're ready to stain. Um, it is really no difference, especially if you, you have a bunch of people cutting, like two or three person cutting, um, then the then you're going to, I believe that question is related to that because we don't keep the, 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 the once you obtain the section, um, immediately you have to be, uh, go to the stainer uh, unless you have multiple and then you keep cutting, keep cutting, and then you stain everything at once. Uh, so thank you. We want to go ahead and um, wrap up to, to keep this on time. And we are absolutely thrilled with everybody who joined us today. Uh, the video recording will be available later. And we 
are going to have more in the series of Fernando and his expertise to share with all of the transplant and the organ community. And again, we, we really thank everyone for joining us and feel free to reach out to us with more questions and, and we will follow up on those. So thank you again.